you all for coming, especially at 4.30 on a Friday. Um, and also, I want to thank everyone for inviting me, bringing me here. Lisa is not in this audience. I'd like to thank her and Stephanie, who are standing outside. But they did a lot to bring me here. Um, I've only been back in the United States four weeks from two and a half years in Cape Town from a bit of culture shock and I'm using inappropriate phrases. Um, <laughs> that said, uh, what I'd like to do is talk to you about three issues today. Oh, there are four bullet points up here. Um, and I'm gonna try and stick to a script so I can stay within a time frame. but I'm happy to answer all questions, any questions at the end. So I wanna keep to a time frame so that I leave that time allocated to all of you. Um, and I will bring up some issues that make, will cause some controversy perhaps. So first I wanna talk about the fluidity of borderland. Again, this comes on the heels of my time in Cape Town uh, and my research with refugee and human rights law. I'd also like to talk about my research methodology which ties into the demographic profile of Arab immigrants uh, and all the challenges that I face. And the last concept I'd like to speak about is foreign citizens. And this is the idea of how these Lebanese Arab immigrants parlay their identity um, in a modern day context. So with that in mind, uh, I'd like to speak about defining borderlands. So as many of you know, borderlands are constructed by colonial constructions. And this is kind of an obvious point when we look at the US-Mexican border after 1821, um, when the Spanish were finally overthrown, and then we look at 1848 with the US-Mexican War. And then in the case of South Africa, they have the Zimbabwean border, which became more apparent in 1980. Now, as I say this, these constructions are made, but most people ignore them and they continue to cross. And this becomes very apparent that many immigrants and refugees are completely unaware of the laws and practices of individual states. And they're just thinking about their own personal situations. And this becomes really apparent in a document that I found in the US archives. In 1907, US immigration inspector T.F. Shoemaker asked Syrian uh, um, alien Suleiman Muhammad if he knew he had done something illegal when crossing the US border. Muhammad responded, quote, I don't know the difference between Mexico and the United States, end of quote. Muhammad was promptly arrested and deported. Now, I've recently begun to explore this question of the borderland experience in broader terms. And in South Africa, I was calling it the Mexicanization, which didn't really appeal to them. So I said, okay, I'm gonna call it the Zimbabweification, um, where both countries deal with profound xenophobia. In the US, we can talk about Donald Trump. And in South Africa, we have Zulu King Goodwill Zulathini, who said foreigners need to go home. We also have suggestions in both countries that there need to be guest worker programs. And as many of you studied US-Mexican history, we've had the birth hour program, which most South Africans aren't even aware about. And I know that today we have the H-1A visas for the agricultural workers and the H-1B visas for the high tech workers. And then we have the H-2B visas as well. But that said, these aren't enough to accommodate the people coming to both countries. But this last issue I find very interesting, and that's the ports of entry and the communities that are built around such spaces. We have Nogales, we have the Basin Bridge um, in South Africa, and we both have the rivers of the Rio Grande in here along the US-Mexican border, and then the Limpopo River along the South African Zimbabwe River, um, or border, excuse me. So along the US-Mexican border, we can start to the 19th century. Oh my gosh, you guys are hearing all that turning. Okay, the Arab migration has indeed had significant borderland um, presence. So you will see, if you look, I just didn't get my um, pointer. You can look at the Nogales, you can look at Ciudad Juarez, you can look at Eagle Pass. But if we look a little further south, we can see in Durango and Coahuila areas, the Cedars and Torreon and Coahuila. Now this image is from a park in Torreon and the state of Coahuila, which is in northern Mexico. And these cedars represent the cedars in the tree, the Lebanon, and the Lebanese flag in particular. And it serves as a backdrop to this PowerPoint because it's a symbol of homeland ideals in Mexico. And as one Lebanese immigrant told his nephew, quote, I swear I like Torreon better than Paris, end of quote. Now, if any of you have been to Torreon, I'm not a little skeptical about this quote. But anyway, <laughs> this is what it says, and this is what is undocumented, and it said, now, I'm, this area is of interest to me because this is where my great-grandfather settled. So today, I'd like to talk about my book and my research, and I want to start with my personal connection to my work. 
So it follows my journey to locate Antonio Achard Eat, and this is my great-grandfather in Mexico, and tracing him to his birth name, Hamut Ait, and his birthplace in Lebanon. I never knew my great-grandfather and knew very little of his eldest son, my grandfather, Sayid Ait Alfaro, and that's where my name Alfaro comes from. Now, my grandfather came to the United States as a bracero worker in the 1940s, and the U.S. immigration official changed his name to Ruben Alfaro. Now, what he did when he came to the U.S. is that he loaded dead American soldiers' bodies off the boats in Brooklyn. And they didn't want Americans to see these dead bodies for morale reasons. But my grandfather got an injury in his back and for the rest of his life, although he drove a truck, he was always in a lot of pain. Now, stories of these two men have been passed down from generation to generation and captured my imagination. And as I began studying Mexican history, I wondered how and why um, did my great-grandfather and grandfather's stories fit into Mexican historiography? So in the fall of 1998, part of my dissertation research, I began the task of compiling a database of Middle Eastern immigrants who came to Mexico and registered with the Department of Migration in the 1930s. And while examining over actually 10,000 immigration records, my sample turned out to 8,000 in the end because there were 2,000 duplications, I stumbled on the ficha, the card of my great-grandfather, Antonio Ashard Eat. His picture and description match my family records, and this is the only piece of tangible um, history I've ever found of my family. So while doing this research, what I encountered was a new dimension of Mexican social history and that there are many ways to be Mexican in the 20th century. So what I want to do is talk about my sources. They're problematic. I'm speaking um, before this talk with some of my colleagues about this. And starting in 1926, the Mexican government had immigrants register with the Secretaría de Relaciones Exteriores, which is their Mexican State Department. Now, just as a little footnote, I'd like to add, the U.S. government did not start to do this until 1940. So I'd like to say the U.S. government copied the Mexicans by waiting to do this Alien Registration Act. <laughs> My colleagues do not like to hear this oftentimes, <laughs> but I just want to say this. I also looked at citizen complaints to Mexican presidents, and in particular, President Lázaro Cárdenas, who was president from 1934 to 1940. A lot of people wrote in complaining about these Arab Middle Eastern immigrants. I also looked at diplomatic correspondence between the U.S. and Mexico. <laughs> I also looked at family letters that were housed at the Ibero-Americana University in La Laguna region, which is again in the, state of, in the city of Torreon in Coahuila. Many of these letters were in Arabic and had been translated into Spanish. I also looked at immigration and naturalization records in the U.S., and in particular, court cases of Syrian immigrants trying to enter the United States surreptitiously. Um, and that was a very rich source, and I did this in 2003, and when I returned to the archives in 2009, they were no longer there. So it really makes me quite sad to say that. I also conducted interviews in northern Mexico and Mexico City. So now, with that kind of picture in mind, I'm going to tell you all the hurdles that I faced in doing this type of research um, and how I'm packing it. Okay. So I spoke at length during the break, or before the speech, this talk, about the geopolitical changes in the Middle East. Um, so my work starts during the Ottoman Empire through the mandates of World War I and World War II. The Levant included Lebanon, Syria, Cyprus, Israel, Jordan, and Palestine. So depending on the immigration time period, you have different categories of personhood. Now, in the book, you'll see I use Middle Easterners for its geographic connotation. Um, and this is primarily because I gave a talk in Mexico City in 2001, immediately finishing my dissertation, and I had a very well-known Mexican intellectual of Lebanese Christian descent say, how dare you call us Los Árabes? Those are those terrorists from 9-11. So this is why my book has the title it has. Now that said, I'm very um, slippery in my use of Middle Easterner and Arab immigrants in this talk today. I'm fully aware of the differences, so I will go through that, but I just want to let you know as an audience, so if you want to beat me up during the break, I welcome it, because we have this issue about how to, the categories and terms to use, and I find it very problematic after studying this for decades. That said, um, it is reductionistic, and the same way that the term Latin America is, so I want to give that acknowledgement. Um, okay, so with that in mind, we also have the changing U.S. immigration laws, 
And in 1891, the U.S. passed the Disease Act, and this required steamship companies to ensure that the passengers that boarded in Europe were free of disease. If they arrived in the United States with, let's say, trachoma, I'm sorry, um, the companies were then held liable for the housing and feeding of these passengers, and oftentimes the passage back to their um, country of origin. So to maintain their customer base and their income streams, steamship companies started to use Veracruz along the Atlantic coast as a port of entry. Lastly, we have the Civil War in Mexico slash, slash Mexican Revolution, depending on which Mexican historian you speak with. And that said, if there's anyone marked a few students here, graduate students, yay, you guys can beat me up. Are you still calling it Civil War or is it Mexican Revolution? I had one, I had talked with Bill Beasley this morning. Well, he just referred to it as uh, Yusei Revolution. Yusei Revolution, okay. If you talk to Pablo Picasso at Columbia, he calls it the Civil War. So I'm always like, who am I speaking to? Okay. A lot of problems during that 10-year decade, let's say, and beyond. Okay. That said, 10% of the Mexican population gets killed. There's ma major economic dislocation during this time. Um, and then in terms of scholarly work, many of the documents were destroyed. So how do you talk and write about this period in Mexican history? So with all this in mind, let's all talk about why people from the Middle East um, immigrated to for, to Mexico. Now, in the 19th century, Mount Le Lebanon was divided between Muslims and Druze and Christians on the other. There's a complex set of civil wars um, pitting them against one another. There's a massacres in Mount Lebanon, which then trickles to Damascus. It leads to international interventions. And what ends up happening is religious differences start to spill over into military service, and in particular, the mandatory conscription. So I've got an Ottoman scholar here in the audience, so I'm treading carefully here. General conscription starts in 1855, and then it gets reintroduced in 1909. And this general conscription in 1855 uh, was for Christians and Jews alike, and they could pay a tax to be exempt. However, this concession ends in 1909 with the Young Turks, and mandatory conscription was reintroduced in 1909. So in one of my interviews in Torion with Zain Shamut, who is a Shiite, from Muslim, uh, Shiite Muslim from southern Lebanon, he decided to immigrate after his brother Hassan was forced to fight in the Ottoman army in the Balkans. And Hassan became a prisoner of war, excuse me, Hassan, yeah, and received a severe injury in the stomach. He fortunately escaped and returned to his home in southern Lebanon, but he was a different person. So Zain, the person I was speaking with, fearful of repeating his brother's misfortune, left his homeland in 1907. There's also this question, and Raul and I spoke a bit about this, the Ottoman treatment of its subjects. This is a long-going debate um, of Christians, Jews, and local Muslims. Um, it's long been debated as a stimulus for immigration, and I'd say historians have reached little consensus. What I will say is that Ottoman scholar Camille Kalpat points out that, quote, the available Ottoman documents indicate that, in fact, the number of Muslim immigrants was substantial, and he suggests that the Muslims' departure from the Ottoman Empire was clandestine, end of quote. So I mentioned this level of secrecy around the Muslim immigration from the Middle East because many of the records that, have, that I use and I draw on probably skew the actual religion in place of, um, of departure because they feared being deported, not the similar to what people face today. More importantly, it does appear that Ottoman treatment of its subjects, regardless of religion, did motivate many to migrate to Mexico. And lastly, there's the famine in 1914, where the Ottoman Empire sided with Germany during World War I, and there was a blockade um, around the Syrian coast and prohibited the entry of all imported food supplies. They estimate that one-eighth of the population um, died of starvation or starvation-related diseases. So you see a big a migration flow in the 1920s after this period. Anyway, so with these research hurdles in mind, we can now see this migration path, and I will start to provide some of the demographic data for you. So you can see that many of the immigrants would then leave from Beirut um, to Marseille, to Veracruz, Havana, depending on the health, on board. This led to confusion on where they were going. There were cases that I've read about whereby someone thought they were going to New York and they'd end up in Buenos Aires or they'd end up in Rio de Janeiro. Um, and in one particular case, I'll read um, from one of the US records of where they um, stopped a, a woman. 
It said, according to Atal's testimony, the ho hotel keeper in Marseille, France, Elias Haddad, also from Sor, Syria, told her that Mexico was nearer to El Paso than New York and bought her a ticket to Veracruz. Cecilia decided, therefore, to migrate to Mexico first. So there's stories like this all over the records where they get picked up, and this is a story they would then tell the immigration officials. Okay. So to return to the geopolitical changes, I'm going to provide some maps next. These are from my book. Um, I became inspired to share these maps again because I was in a talk this past summer where a scholar did it. I was like, oh, this helps me. So let's go back to these maps. So if you can look and see in 1900, that's the Ottoman Empire. So if someone migrated during this time, they were a Turk or an Ottoman, um, and in the records they'd be considered a Turco. Okay, now this term Turco in Latin America and Mexico has a certain connotation today, so we can speak about that. Uh, and there are debates. My colleague in Brazil claims that El Turco isn't that negative anymore. I'm not so sure, but we can discuss that. Um, and then if you look in 1920, you can see now there's the country of Turkey, and then you can see site, and then you can see the mandates under the French and Lebanon and Syria. So there is one case of a gentleman that I speak about, Juan Apisayu, and he was able to get a French passport, which he then used to cross into the United States to get arms during the Mexican Revolution, just to kind of complicate these geopolitical elements. Now, in 1948, is what they tend to talk about today, um, you can see Syria got independence in 1946, we have Lebanon in 1943, um, and Israel in 1948, and then Transjordan in 1946, okay? So, again, shows the complications of when they migrated, um, how they would be labeled, the categories of personhood. So with this in mind, I show this slide and I cringe a bit, but I want to talk about this category of los árabes as an ethno-cultural construct. This term Arabians, or árabes, if you translate, is used in the records. It can refer to Saudi Arabians, but probably not. Um, we have, as I've said, terms and peoples vary by time, but we also have it by country. So to further complicate this nomenclature, the vocabulary used, in the U.S., we often see the term Syrian and Arabs. In Ecuador and Mexico, they have Lebanese and some Palestinians. In Argentina and Brazil, they have Syrio or Syrian Lebanese, or Syrio Lebanese. And then in Chile and Honduras, you tend to hear more about the Palestinians. Now, that doesn't mean they're not from those nation states in today's constructs. It just tends to how the nomenclature comes out. I want to be very clear that Armenians do not identify as Arabs. They are found in the Mexican archives under ethnicity, along with Persians and Iranians. And again, they don't always identify as Arabs as well. So I want to be clear that these categories are messy and not correct in many ways. Uh, so with the slipperiness in mind, I want to talk about a theoretical concept that I think is very important to talk about um, with regard to these categories. And that is what Donna Gabaccia calls historical nationalism. And she writes about this in 1999. She's a well-known immigration scholar that writes about Sicilians in New York. That's kind of her earlier work. And what she talks about is that the hegemony of national historiography persists at the expense of national and other histories, precluding the exploration of the many connections between nation building and migration possible across different frames of analysis. So in other words, um, it talks about how research is conducted because how archivists catalog information and how that information catalog then affects future generations, especially historians, on how they write about history. And in the case of Mexico, the archives were organized, if you go to the Archivo General de Nación in Mexico City, and it's actually a gallery too during my research time, I think it's changed since then, these categories were organized by ethnicity according to, and not place of origin, so it reflected what the archivists thought and the historians' constructions of the Middle East were in that particular time period. So the Mexican meta-discourse and mestizaje sometimes includes Los Arabes as Middle Easterners, and it becomes very complicated. Now, when you think about it, this seems like an obvious point to make, that histories are reflected by how archive, archivists organize information. But I will make this little comment or side note. If you look at the amount of literature in Mexican history written about Oaxaca, it's because Oaxaca has one of the best organized archives. 
in, in terms of its percentage to all of Mexican history. And again, this is a reflection on how the archivist power has really changed and shaped how Mexican history is written about. Now, I say this because when I was doing my research, the documents on Mexican immigration laws were very difficult to come by because they weren't deemed really important. Now it's changing. In 2001, the Mexican government pro provided the FOMO of all the different um, immigration laws, but they did leave some key things out. So this next document I want to share with you is from Diario Social. It was published on July 15, 1927, and I found it at the Columbia Law Library. I never found it in Mexico. Um, and what it says in Spanish, translated roughly, Syrians, Lebanese, Palestinians, Arabs, Turks have caused economic and social instability and felt in an unfavorable manner. We need to limit them in the commercial sector. Now, I argue in my book that this is a turning point to assimilate into Mexico. So the immigrants had to decide if we're going to stay in Mexico, we better try and assimilate and not draw much attention to ourselves. But from a historical nationalism perspective, how this is left out and is so important, I think is very, is, is something to reflect upon. Now, as I point this document out to you, I'm gonna then say, show you how this is then kind of contradicted. Now, this next slide is the immigrant registration card of my great grandfather. So I wanna go through these categories with you. So at the same time, we have this law saying no Arabs in the commercial sector. I don't know if you can read, but you can see my great grand. Oh, can you guys? Oh, perfect. You can see. <coughs> we'll start from the beginning. He comes into Mexico in 1907, November 15th. This is what he says, and he's registering in 1932. This is a 25 years in which to, um, how should I say, recreate to reflect on his identity. All right. These are all his physical characteristics. I actually cataloged it in my database, and at some point I realized, what am I gonna do with all this physical characteristics? If anybody's interested in this data, let me know. I'm, you know, a couple of things. Like, he even gets into particular features. He has um, a cicatriz um, in his left cheek. He has a scar. Um, he's 50 years old. He was born in 1881. He's married. He's a comerciante. He's a peddler just like they were trying to ban five years later. So obviously they weren't enforcing this law. His, his um, native language is Arabe, but he speaks Spanish. He's born in Sublime, Mount Lebanon. Um, I went back to Sublime, Mount Lebanon in 2004, and I found my family there. So I, I take that question during Q&A, but I was able to use this document 100 years later. Um, his actual nationality is Arabe, so you can see. Even though he's from Lebanon, as we'd know it today, from Mount Lebanon, he identifies as an Arab. So this then further confuses these categories of personhood. He's Muslim, and he's white, and he lives in Nazis Orlando. Okay. Now this last point, this makes my mother very uncomfortable, but I will talk about this anyway. Um, they say, who can you use as a reference? And he doesn't know anybody. He gives us references. So either he wasn't a very nice guy, or he was afraid to tell Mexican authorities. I'm not sure which. I will also like to point out with this document that they were supposed to pay a 10,000 peso um, fee to register. Whether he actually paid that or it was a bribe, I'm not clear, because the documents never say paid or unpaid. And so, but there was a law that was put into place saying that they needed to pay it if you were from the Middle East. Um, so I say that because this sample of these cards, these 8,000 that I look at, are a sample of a sample. These are people willing to come forward and register with the Mexican authorities, okay? So we don't know how many undocumented there were. There was speculation or there was some research, how should I say, I dabble in speculating that there's some in the Yucatan um, because I found several of these with the same entry date of September 22nd. I think it was like 1911 or so. Um, and it's like 600 of them. So I was like, this is a little strange. So I speculate that this group had gotten a hold of a stamp and was um, taking their liberties with it. So with that in mind, I want to go through and share with you what I did find. Um, so now you're good skeptics of this data. Um, so how many Arab immigrants in Mexico? More than 8,000 legally registered between 1878 and 1951. If we look at Mexican census data during the same time period, 1895 to 1940, there's 36,000. Um, and then if you go up to 1960 and you include Palestinians, the numbers goes up to 37,500. Now if you talk to people from the Centro de Bones, the Lebanese center in Mexico City, they will say there are 380,000 to 400,000 of Mexico's 100 million that have Lebanese Christian descent, okay? 
So one of the common misperceptions is that it was male-only migration. We often hear that about the Arab immigrants here in the United States. This isn't true. Um, it's predominantly male, 62% uh, men, 38% women, but over time the migration becomes more gender balanced, indicating family reunification. And it also shows that men didn't come alone. They'd often go back and bring wives back, um, et cetera. Where they settle in Mexico, um, again, you see the ports of entry, Mexico City, Distrito Federal, they settle in Veracruz, Puebla, La Laguna, this northern settlement, Chihuahua, um, and these, settle, these settlement patterns really reflect family and business links, and there's also the great economic growth at the beginning, at the end of the 19th century. So what I'd like to do now is talk a little about the religion aspect, and this is a bit problematic. Okay, so we have 64% that are Catholic, but this includes Catholics and Maronites. Um, few put Maronite on their cards, but I suspect this is because they were coached on the boats or within the community not to put that down and just put Catholic because it's close enough. Um, we also have the Jewish population at 8%. So I found a lot of Arab Jews in the population sample. Orthodox, um, often Melkites, 6%. In the Muslim community, there was only 4.6%, and they never indicated Sunni or Shia. So we don't know how that broke out, or I don't know how that broke out. 2% indicated that they were Druze. Now, as I mentioned earlier, uh, Camille Karpat estimated that the, the Ottoman Empire didn't let Muslims leave. So the numbers of Christians and Muslims are skewed. I did find many Christians with names like Ramadan, Mustafa, um, as Catholics. So I was a little skeptical of those, but I didn't change them when I was doing my um, tabulations because I felt that was me taking too many liberties with the data. Now, in 1999, I studied with some Middle Eastern scholars at Georgetown University. So they asked me to look into this question of how many Muslims are in Mexico. And at the time, they were reporting 15,000. That was like a 1980 um, estimate. So I went into the community and I estimated about 1,000. Uh, but this could be woefully low. This was done in 1999. Now, what I found is that there were Sunni and Shiite converts. I also found diplomats in Mexico City. And in doing this ethnographic research, I interviewed one gentleman, Omar Wiesten, who led a Sunni-based um, group, and they had funding from the Saudi Arabians. Um, but they, the Saudis apparently took their money, and they had to close their doors, and he then moved to Morelia. Now, in Torreon, I found general Islam kind of practice. When I asked you Sunni or Shia, they couldn't really, they just say, well, Muslims, uh, but yet when you went into the mosque, which I'll show you in a second here, they had materials from Iran. So that was kind of the one way that it seemed. So in the mosque that um, I visited, it was the first recognized mosque in Mexico. Although if you look on websites and you do searches, they'll say there are other mosques throughout Mexico. This was the only one, to my knowledge, that's been formally recognized by the Mexican government. It's on Guadalajara Street in the Colonia of Nuevo Los Angeles. A wealthy merchant jeweler named Elias Sarhan Salim and his wife lost their daughter Soraya in a car accident, and they decided to donate their money to build a mosque in her memory. So with the help of Hassan Zain Shamut, the same man I, I was interviewing earlier, um, who designed it and donated his time, the mosque was completed in 1989, and in 1993 it re received official status from the Mexican government as a religious association. When I was there, there were about 10 to 20 people that day. Um, so in addition, to this question, we have the nationality of these Arab immigrants. Um, and as you'll see, the nationality immigrants reflect, again, these geopolitical changes in the Middle East. And the category of Arabe probably reflects Ottoman subjects, but it also, you look at the predominance of the Lebanese. And these Lebanese immigrants to compass all Arabs. So I think what's unique about the Mexican case compared to other Latin American cases is that this Lebanese discourse is very dominant. And I call it the hegemonic discourse. And it becomes manifest, for instance, in this Lebanese Independence Day in 1950. And what you see here is the woman wearing the chiapa, traditional chiapas dress, and the woman in the Lebanese. And then this man right here is Domingo Curi. And he's very well known in the historical records as kind of the greeter. Because he was fluent in Spanish, French, and Arabic, he would then greet many of the Middle Easterners when they get off the boat and say, oh, you're from Beirut, you go to Puebla and you'll find your relatives, you're from um, 
Dublin, you go to northern Mexico, and you will find family. So he was really guiding people on where to go. He had a house. He let many people stay there. He also would pay for um, train fare. So there's stories in some of the records um, of women and men discussing this. Now, I would like to say he's one of the first foreign citizens in Mexico, whereby he parlays both being Mexican, because he adopts a Mexican identity, and also Lebanese. Um, and this foreign citizen idea is something is a, I describe as a relational, fungible identity. It reflects the, ident the values of society. It draws on a constructed Lebanese-Mexican identity. And I say this because if you went to Lebanon, this, they're not on the same page. Second and third generation Arab immigrants parlayed their immigrant network, amassed capital, and forged an immigrant position and became foreign citizens in the Mexican nation. They used their foreignness as a path to elite status and legitimation. Their identities are flexible and could be foreign while joining the Mexican nation. And this also is used to explain their wealth in poverty areas of Mexico. I found this also in South Africa among some of the German and British expatriates. And the most idealized Mexican Lebanese foreign citizen is Carlos Menin Palou. So I'm going to talk a few minutes about him. Now, in terms of Chisme, he's the rumored godfather of Salma Hayek's daughter Valentina, if you guys didn't know that. He's the second wealthiest man in the world as of today. He is wealthy yet connected to his Lebanese ancestry. He helps the Sentinel Liboness and its publications. And if any of you know about Sanborn, he owns Sanborn, so his publications then go into Sanborn. He controls about 80% of the landlines in Mexico, 70% of cell phones. As many of you may know, Mexicans pay the highest rate to, pay, to receive and to make calls in anybody in the world. So this question is, how did he make his money? Now, this is from the Wall Street Journal, 2011. He, as of March 2015, he had $76.4 billion. That's as 10 days ago, he's only at $49.7 billion, so the stock market isn't doing well for him. <laughs> um, he owns 3% of Apple stock. He's the largest shareholder of the New York Times. He employs about 270,000 people. He was ranked as the 15th most powerful, per powerful person. He's rumored to give Hillary Clinton quite a bit of money, the Clinton Initiative. And he controls between 2 and 8% of the Mexican economy. Now, he purchased the Mexican soccer club Leon and Pachuca. And he apparently also bought Mad Madrid Real in 2012. And it is virtually impossible for Mexicans to go about their lives without in some way contributing to his fortune. So it's also often called Glimlandia. Okay. So in order to keep his ties, he went back to Lebanon in 2010. He helps maintain his Lebanese-Mexican discourse. He went to Jezin. Um, in 2012, he also opened the Museo Sumaya, which became free to the public, was showing off his Rodan and his dollies. And as a foreign citizen and part of the um, Centro Libones, he and other elites continue to celebrate their Lebanese-ness. And they donated this immigrant statue um, to the Lebanese government in October 2003. The statue is a 19th century immigrant. And it's, it's, it's over, well, you can see in the background. Um, it towers over bustling traffic in Aven, um, Avenue Charles Hulu in Beirut, which is East Beirut during the Lebanese Civil War. Um, and the Centro Libones used to proudly have it on its website. Now it's, it's in one of its latest editions where businessmen went from Mexico to go visit this, and they're all standing around the statue. And then in 2006, the Mexican government issued a postage stamp bearing a similar resemblance um, to commemorate 125 years of Lebanese presence in Mexico. So I'd like to return momentarily to historical nationalism. And when I finished my book, I became really interested in learning about other immigrant experiences in Mexico and placing Mexico in a larger continental immigration process. And I call this techniques of governance. And I found these conversations between US and Mexican diplomats. Um, and they basically challenged this idea of US exceptionalism as an immigrant nation, such as Mexico having its first registration in 1926 versus the United States in 1940. And I saw this dance between Mexico and the United States, that's what I often call it. 
And Mexico is absorbing many of the immigrants bound for the U.S. and how then the U.S. negotiates that. I didn't find Mexico to be extremely racist. And I found actually a conflicted relationship that Mexico's had with foreigners, both for Arab immigrants and for the Mexicans then who come here to the United States. So I looked then at 2006 at these two Mexican think tanks, CIDE and Comexi, how they reported on Mexican public opinion of the country's role in international affairs. And it said, there is a linger, quote, there's a lingering distrust of foreigners, of others who are outsiders and different, and they're not considered to be part of the national community, end of, end of quote. So with this in mind, in 2013, I started looking at who then becomes a naturalized citizen in Mexico. And no one could really answer this question. So I went to the Secretary of Relaciones, and I was able to get 6,000 cases, naturalization cases, from 1913 to 1937. And what I found was that 27% that became naturalized citizens were Guatemalans, 17% were Chinese, 15% were Spanish, and 12% were Middle Easterners. The data did not show a consistent practice of implementation of racist thinking, rather for political expediency, and it raised more questions than it answers. So in conclusion, I'd like to make a few points. We see how methodological nationalism has shaped how stories have been framed and passed down both in the Middle East to Mexico and the poorest borderlands. We also see a multicultural Mexico through Arab immigration and the naturalization of deemed undesirable foreigners. We also see expanding discourse to include immigrants in the role of Mexican history. And foreign citizens, such as Carlos Salim Halu's family and immigrant self-positioning in the Mexican nation have come to dominate a portion of the Mexican economy. So in the column, to kind of bring this back to more or less academic points, in the column, Ask a Mexican, a reader writes to Gustavo Ariano and the Tucson Weekly the following. Dear Mexican, first of all, Please don't think that I'm a self-loathing Mexican. I was born in the United States to northern Mexican parents. As far as I know, my ancestry is just Indian, Spanish, and a little French. For some strange reason, I have developed an intense fascination, you might say love, for Arab culture, language, cuisine, etc., especially Lebanese, Syrian, Jordanian, Palestinian, and Iraqi. And I don't even have a drop of Arab blood in me. It goes on. Would a DNA test tell me what my ancestry is and would it turn up my Lebanese and my family tree? Let me know. Wannabe Arab, a.k.a. Al Libanes. <laughs> Dear wannabe Arab, it goes on, quote, your chances that the sangre of the Levant courses through your veins is more likely than gabachos may think. As you noted, Lebanese did migrate to Mexico throughout the 20th century and contributed to the patria in ways both positive, Tacos al Pastor, Salma Hayek, and negative, <laughs> billionaire Carlos Salim Halu. It goes on. Also, don't forget that most...